I'm Daisy. And I'm Terry. And this is the Monday Monday Mindset Mindset Podcast, Podcast. where we share things of interest to us and hopefully to you. So let's get started with episode number 205. And this week, it's Daisy's turn to share something with us. Daisy, what do you have? Well, Terry, I am back with the episode that I was going to come back with last time. And then I got sidetracked and uh, decided to go with something else. So I am back with another bite-sized episode from Rongan Chatterjee's podcast, Feel Better, Live More. And we are back with Dr. Wendy Suzuki talking about anxiety, why anxiety is your superpower. And the full episode it comes from is how exercise changes your brain and why anxiety is your superpower. So he managed to get two bite-sized episodes out of one longer episode. Uh, Yes, so back with Dr. Wendy Suzuki, who's a neuroscientist and a professor of neural science and psychology at New York's University Center for Neural Science. And Rongan kicks off by asking Dr. Suzuki about why she calls anxiety a powerful self-help tool. And also she talks about it being protective. Um, Most people who have anxiety, he says, don't really want to have anxiety and would struggle to call it a powerful self-help tool. So explain yourself, Dr. Wendy Suzuki. (laughs) She talks about, and it won't come as much surprise to our listeners, and certainly not to you, she talks about the evolutionary benefit of anxiety, that good old fight or flight response. It was a response that evolved to protect us, but it was more of a response to physical danger back in the day. So you hear a crack of a twig, boom, anxiety response. And then that releases a stress response that increases your heart rate and sends much needed blood to your muscles so that you can either fight or run away. And it's an extremely important mechanism and why we are here today, she says. So, you know, we can't be without it. However, it's always a but, the mechanism has not evolved with our evolving culture. So now we get anxious through a wide variety of things, emails, texts, the news, social media, etc., etc. And we're still having these similar stress responses. So then she says, well, then surely it's not helpful. It's not a helpful response. But it is helpful, she says, because at its core, anxiety is protective. And the first step is to turn the volume down. Our anxiety levels are too high and uncontrolled at this level. And we need to, what we need to do is get them to a more controlled level. Giving a talk, for example, she says, and I think in the longer episode, Rongan had been talking about this because she cites his good example. Um, but giving a talk, this is a good example of good anxiety. She says, you're going to give a much better talk with some anxiety keeping you on the ball. She jokes that if you were in a more relaxed, chilled, watching Netflix, weekend kind of mood, you'd probably give a pretty crappy talk. So you need a little bit of fear and anxiety to give the best talk you can. So she says, anxiety can bring gifts to many parts of our lives. Rongan goes on to talk about this protective nature of anxiety. And he asks whether it's accurate to say it's the same response to facing a lion as it is to a full email box? Good question, I thought, because this gets thrown around all the time, doesn't it? That this stress response back in the day, yeah, was there as protective fight or flight. And it's the same today. And people cite things like I did, emails, texts, all the rest of it. But, you know, is it the same? And then he also asks her about some of the actions that a lot of us take to change our state of anxiety, things like sugar, alcohol, drugs, shopping, whatever it is. How can we maybe change this reaction to the stress response? So Dr. Suzuki explains that there is and always has been a hierarchy of the stress response. So the response to a fox would not be the same as it would be to a lion. You might be a little bit afraid of a fox, but a lot afraid of a lion. (laughs) So there was always a gradation to your levels of anxiety. And she says, so it's the same today. 
An unexpected Zoom request from your boss last thing on a Sunday night that they want to meet you on a a Zoom meeting first thing Monday morning is going to create a much larger stress response than a pile up of emails on a Monday morning than a few missed texts from a friend. So there is this gradation of stress response. And then there's the action orientation of the stress response. And this, she said, this is where the superpower part lies. Everyone has the stress response. The superpower part that comes with it, or that can come with it, is productivity. So she talks about a what if list. What if, back to that example of the boss emailed me for a Zoom meeting because dot, 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 usually a list of bad things. I'm not good at my job. She's going to fire me. This, that and the other. Start catastrophizing and getting really anxious about it. This what if list is a really common form of stress response to anxiety inducing stresses. But what you need to remember, she says, is that that what if list revolves around things that you really care about. You don't tend to have what if lists for things you don't care about or find really easy. You have them for things you do care about, things that are important to you. So they're showing you what is valuable to you and what you care about in your life. So what are you going to do about it? You shift your what if list into a to do list. So you put an action on it. So back with this email from your boss wanting a Zoom meeting example. What are you worried about? Your productivity at work, maybe? She says, well, the action you could put on that is to ask a few of your colleagues how they think you're doing or ask advice from people like, you know, maybe you work with a coach or good friends. Talk through the anxiety with somebody who cares about you and what you're doing. Take action on the things that come up in your resulting to-do list. That's your to-do list that comes from your what-if list. And this will help relieve the anxiety. And, of course, it will also help you prepare for that meeting that you've got to have anyway. And I know I always feel better about something when I'm prepared. It's one of my things that's, you know, I guess that's where the, the questioner comes in, where I have to try and figure out all eventualities or as many as I can. And even if it's still anxiety inducing, the thing I've got to do If I feel like I'm going in there a bit prepared and have a better idea of what might happen, I always find that helpful and it does reduce the anxiety. And I guess it does sort of having that when she talks about having a little bit of fear and anxiety, you know, keeps you on your toes, doesn't it? So she says, acknowledge your anxiety about being centered around things that you care about. I kind of hear that, Daisy, as, you know, lots of different phrases and ways we could describe things. But in some ways, for me, that's really about reframing that arousal feeling. Because good arousal, excitement, investment, feels very similar to fear, dread, nervousness. It's what frame we put on it. Mm. And so, like you said, it's kind of reframing our anxiety as something that helps us prepare, something that helps us accomplish some things. Um, You know, I'm a big procrastinator. A little bit of anxiety kicks my butt into doing something and making progress on something. So I like that reframe of it. Yeah, I like the fact that, yeah, if you're anxious about something, it's telling you that it's something that's important to you. Rongan says another thing to do is to get curious about what it might be teaching you and what you can learn from it to make life easier going forward. And, you know, they start talking about mindset and reframing. And, you know, can you look at this thing that's making you anxious in a different way? And she uses herself as an example. She says as a child, she loved her classes at school, but she was very shy and she had this internal battle. Every time she wanted to ask a question, she had this battle between really wanting to find out the answers, but also being scared of of looking stupid, and being called stupid for asking a silly question. And she says that what she would say now to her younger self 
is to ask yourself why you're there. And what if I was to give you the job of asking at least two questions in class? This is what you bring to the class. This is your responsibility. You need to ask two questions that are of interest to you. So your mindset switched from the fear of looking stupid to a sense of responsibility that asking questions is your job. And she tells her students this in her classes now that she teaches. And I know that this is one of these things that I'm sure there's somebody out there and I I was sort of questioning, thinking, well, yeah, that's great in theory, but often a little bit more troublesome in practice unless you have a thick skin because kids, (laughs) it's, uh, you know, unless it's not a great teacher, the teacher's not going to look at you as if you're stupid. But if you get ribbing from your peers in the class, that gets a bit more tricky, doesn't it? But but still, you know, it's one of these things that's a good thing to think about. And well, you know what I'm like, I always come up with the what if. <laughs> but the belief system you go in with is important, is the point she's making. And it can often be modified by reframing. Rongen says, If you don't reframe it, but rather dwell on, why am I feeling like this? I want it to go away. He says the trouble with that is that you've lost some agency over what's happening and the chances are good. You think there's something wrong with you. And he says he used to talk to his patients about this and help them figure out what the message was behind the anxiety. He would say, look, this is a is a signal. It's not just something to be got rid of. It's a signal to let us know what we can learn from a situation, which reminded me of Susan David's work. She talks about signposts, doesn't she, with emotions and what they can tell us. And indeed, Dr. Suzuki goes on to say, yeah, that all these uncomfortable emotions, anxiety, sadness, anger, they weren't invented to annoy us. They're warning systems. And she references this as um, a reframe that a friend of hers gave, and I didn't write down the name. But she says that the way they suggested she look at it, instead of anxiety being a big, heavy weight dragging you down, what if instead it's this little kid that's just sort of jumping up and down and trying to get your attention? So instead of, oh, you know, why me? It's like, oh, okay, yeah. That project is really important to me. And this is a good reminder of that. It's still going to be an uncomfortable emotion and you can't just simply get rid of it. But you might be able to reframe it into something that directs you to what is important to you. So I suppose instead of just getting in a flap, (laughs) actually dig down a little bit and think what's behind it. And of course, they they mention exercise again when it was part of the longer episode. But, you know, Rongan talks about this as being an effective tool to help with anxiety. And she says, yeah, as she's mentioned before, and we mentioned in the other episode I did of hers, that just 10 minutes of walking has an immediate effect on your anxiety levels. Because what happens is your body is releasing dopamine, serotonin, noradrenaline, And this will help you modulate these mood states. And this is part of the thing, isn't it? It's less about the stress response, although that, of course, can be a problem, and especially if it's happening a lot, then you having to you have to release that stress somehow. So as she says, it's protective. It's there to protect us. It's there for a reason. But I was kind of imagining it, visualizing it as this, this trapped thing. So you, you get this stress response and then you, you've got it. You've got this, you've got this, this ball of anxiety that you've, you've got to find a way to release it. And, you know, originally fight or flight, but however you do it, you would have released it through physical exertion. And one way or another, you know, it would be gone until the next time. So I guess that's one of the reasons why exercise is such a good way. And it is so immediate. As she says, you know, this 10 minutes of walking has an immediate effect. Now, it's not always possible to do it as, you know, as an immediate reaction to a stress response. But Rongan asks her, you know, what advice would you give to people who are feeling overwhelmed by levels of stress and anxiety in their lives coming at them from all different directions. They can't, yeah, I just can't, I can't see a way out of it. 
And she says, well, can you start small? Just start small. Just take a little chunk. Like walking, going for a walk when an anxious moment comes in. Or if that's too much, what about a short breath meditation? And she says, you know, there's, there's loads on YouTube. Have a look. But then she talks a little bit about meditation. And she says meditation can have similar beneficial effects to exercise. Things like decreasing negative mood states and increasing positive ones like optimism, which would be a really handy mood state to increase in these situations, wouldn't it? And, you know, and it, and it can help to improve things like focus. And she says, you know, they're very different kinds of activities, one very physical, one not very physical at all, but they have similar effects. And she says she's not really sure why, but what she thinks is that there are different mechanisms going on but that result in the same behavioral output, better mood, better prefrontal cortex function. So she says, start small, but there are tried and tested ways to help decrease anxiety and improve mood. So she said, you know, there's always hope, just take little chunks. Yes, so that's it. A bit of reframing and a few suggestions of, of what you can do to help when that comes in. But I think... I think the big message was this reframing of it and thinking, you know, if you can think of anxiety as a bit of a superpower, as a bit of a gift, as something that is really helping you, that would be a good thing. Like I say, some of these things sometimes, you know, sound great in theory, not always in practice. But again, like she says, take small chunks and maybe with those, you know, those less stressful moments, maybe those are going to be easier to reframe. And then you can work up to the bigger ones that seem like, no, I could never reframe that one. Thanks. It's not going to work. <laughs> Start small. That's what I'm telling myself anyway. <laughs> there you go. I think the other thing to kind of remind yourself based on what you shared, Daisy, is that it is our body's mechanism of giving us some energy. What do we want to do with this energy? Is it toward productivity? Do we need to release the energy? Do we need to, you know calm the energy or whatnot, but rather than, I know it's easier said than done when we just say it, but rather than kind of panic because of this increased energy to really, how am I going to transmute this energy or how am I going to make this energy useful for me? And it sounds a little hokey when I say it, but kind of thanking our body for being able to give us this either warning sign that we need to pay attention to, or this added motivation that will help us rather than as soon as we start to feel it to think, oh no, here it goes again. I'm out of control. I'm, you know, something's wrong with me versus, huh, how can I use this? And, you know, from this episode, how can I use this as a power, a superpower of mine, a skill rather than, something that serves as a barrier, something that holds me back. Yes, I think certainly when I was like when I talked about visualizing it as this as this thing that you get that has to be released somehow, I certainly do better when I can kind of understand what's going on. So yeah, if you get hit with a load of stress and you have this response, your body is going to respond in a certain way. Your body is going to respond okay there are the different levels whether it's a fox or a lion but you're still going to have a response you know your your body is going to prepare you for what it thinks you need to do and you've got to do something with that so I think understanding that that it's going to happen but then you have to do something with it and if you can't turn it into the kind of productive superpower things that she was talking about if it's just too much in your head feeling that stress to actually have something that you can turn on a quick breathing exercise or something just to bring you down just to start making it taking it from that what she talked about earlier about the uncontrolled stress response to a controlled stress response because that's the other thing I think I should imagine it's very difficult to turn it into something productive if it's in that, oh my God, you know, uncontrolled level. So actually being able to do something just to take it down to the kind of, oh, that fox really made me jump and that's kicked me into doing something rather than I'm totally terrified because it's a lion. <laughs> I, you know, I'm just talking about, I'm just talking through things that are sort of going through my head. 
at this point and you know what makes sense to me but that feels like for me anyway because I know what that feeling like that overwhelm you know I can't do anything with this I think having a trick that you can just release some of it okay I'm going to let some of this go and then I'm just going to hold on to the superpower bit that controlled superpower element and turn that into something productive I think that might work for me <laughs> absolutely it's really powerful to me what we can do, you know, I'm really biased here, obviously, but what we can do by adjusting our mindset and how we're thinking about something. And sometimes I think people underestimate our ability to do that. So I always enjoy listening to examples of experts talking about these things and reminding us we can really help set the course of what's going on in our mind by you know, intentionally choosing our interpretation, our using some mechanisms like you described, that our brain doesn't just, you know, it's not just this out of control thing that just does what it wants to do. We have great ability to utilize what it's giving us. Yeah. And I just really like that reframe of, you know, it's a signal. It's a signal. It's telling you something about something that you care about that's really important to you. You wouldn't get that level of anxiety for something that you don't care about. Mm -hmm. So I quite like that instant reframe. So hopefully that gives you some things to think about when it comes to anxiety. I know a lot of people talk about struggling with anxiety and there are certainly lots of things around to stress us out. So hopefully that gives you some things to think about, about potential ways to reframe it and those experiences into something hopefully a little bit more productive. Absolutely. Thanks for sharing that, Daisy. I think it's a great, um, to not overuse this, but it's a great reframe of the whole experience of anxiety because it can be so uncomfortable and so frustrating. And so learning to not get so frustrated with it and really utilize it, I think is a, is a great way again to kind of transform it into something useful. So thank you for sharing this. And I'm quite encouraged to maybe go off and, what I say read, listen to her book. I'm sure it's on Audible, um, Healthy Brain, Happy Life. Uh, so I might, I might give that a go. So until next time, I hope you have a very wonderful week. Take good care, everybody. Bye.